than Nolan Sororities. <laughs> hey, it's not going to be painful, though, Coach. Uh, how's everything going? You guys just finished up your season. Let's get caught up with you. Yeah, we're, uh, fin we're finished up. And, uh, the Rock just, Trojans finished up. Just regrouping and, 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 and getting some commits and, and, uh, and really just settling down. You know, getting away from the players and let the players get away from you for a while. You know how that is, Pat. You've been a, you've been a player before, and it's just just get some distance between each other right now and just regroup and talk about uh, with your staff about what you want to do next year and how you could be successful next year. So you you're um, in a, in a year like this. What I I don't, I don't even know where to begin <laughs> or how how even you begin. But what sort of going into the season were your priorities and how in, in the challenges of, of, of trying to win games and win championships in, in a year like this? My, my, my priority, to be honest about it, Pat, was to uh, make sure my guys stay safe and I stay safe. Let's just be right. honest about it. That's the first thing that I wanted to do to make sure my team stays safe and that I stay safe. Uh, second was try to play as many games as we could play uh, if my team could stay healthy and try to win the Sunbelt Conference uh, regular season championship again. Those are my three things. Um, the So it was just as, as challenging of a year as you've ever had. I mean, what, what it, were the- it was, it, was, it, was, it was weird, it was different. You, you, it, you took a test three times a week. Uh, you didn't know who was gonna be healthy, who was gonna play, where you gonna play. And we were fortunate enough to play a full schedule, but at the end of the day, this, this, this year is a, uh, and uh, if I was athletic director, I wouldn't be looking at this year for, for right. me because it's just, it was madness. It, it, it was, it was madness, man. It, it was madness. And uh, hopefully we can get, we can get through this in the next four or five months. Everybody can get fascinated that we can move on with our lives. Hopefully, hopefully. Hey coach. Yeah. Coach Sutton didn't, didn't have anything in his playbook for this season to help y'all. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. I don't know what he would have done in this season besides <laughs> try to keep himself safe and keep his players safe. Right, right. Overall, it, it was it, it is what it is, and uh, like I said, Pat, we got to regroup, and that's what we're doing with my staff, and got some nice uh, players that have committed to us, and that's what we're concentrating on getting better for next year and try to win it again. Um, let's take it back in the day, Coach. I'm talking back in the day, Chicago, okay, Chicago, Illinois, Corliss High School. When you were running the streets in Chicago, what paint me the picture of? Chicago high school basketball uh, when you were coming out and that would have been, ooh, that would have been the seventies, right? 79, 79, some, 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 some players. I mean, you had uh, a lot of guys don't know who this guy is by the name of Teddy Gross, who I think is one of the best players ever come out of, out of Chicago. Isaiah Thomas, Terry Cummins, Mark Aguirre, Eddie Hughes, Rod Higgins, Craig Hodges. Uh, Eddie Johnson to play with Mark Aguirre at, 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 uh, at Western House. Uh, just the list just goes on and on and on of, of players. Uh, Russell Cross came out a year after us. Uh, Glenn Doc Rivers came out a year after us. So Chicago was loaded with players, loaded with players. And now you're one of the top players in Chicago, one of the top players in the country. Mm -hmm. You somehow, okay, you go to West Ark. College, which now, for those who don't know, is you of A. Fort Smith. Yeah, University of Arkansas, Fort Smith. Yeah. So junior college, you go from Chicago to Fort Smith uh, for junior college. How, how, how does Purgatory. that. Purgatory. <laughs> how was that connection made? Who got. So I'm, I'm assuming Coach Sutton had something to do with Coach Sutton had something to do with that. That's, that's the same. Uh, I think that's the same place. Now, Ron Brewer plays somewhere else. Uh, Oh, okay. Coach Gail Condart and, and Coach Sutton had a, a relationship. Uh, and to be honest about it, I don't know. I, I didn't want to go to West Ark. I, I was all signed to go to DePaul University. And it's not like it is now where you got all these AAU people, all these handlers. Right. You sat down with your high school coach and your mother or father, wherever it was. And I said, I wanted to go to DePaul. I wanted to go play with Terry Cummins and Mark Aguirre. And my high school coach told me, no, Ms. Walker, <laughs> you have to get out of Chicago. Or he's not going to survive. Oh, wow. I'm going, what? I want to go to DePaul. He goes, no, you're not going to DePaul. And my mother goes, well, am I going to pay any money to the University of Arkansas? He said, absolutely not one penny. She goes, well, I guess that's where he's going to, University of Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was end of story. It's not like it is now. It wasn't long and drawn out. That was it. Coach, that was it. What did you do in the Ozarks? I mean, you're an 18, 19, 20-year-old young man in the hill. It was a... 
it was it was even favorite was more of a culture shock than, than just like Fort Smith, just because I'm I'm used to from a big city, just like you from a big city. Right, I'm, right. I'm used to lights. I'm used to things staying open all night long, and you get to Fort Smith and you get to Fayetteville, and everything is closing early. You know, it's no, it's no, it's no, uh, it's no nightlife, which I I was used to hanging out. And it, was just, it was just a different adjustment, but it, it was the best decision I ever made. It was different. Yeah, you you played three seasons, um, averaged about fifteen points a game, uh, five rebounds. What um, and then ended up being twelve. 12 pick, 12 pick yeah. in the draft. Where, where were you? How, how was the draft night parties? Uh, Wasn't no draft night party. That day, <laughs> it's a different era, man. It's, it's a lot more money involved. It's a totally different era, Pat. I'm just telling you now. Well, was, how do you find out? Are you sitting with coach or your family? Or no, I mean, you, they would, they would, as a matter of fact, you would, you would, you would get mail in from different, different uh, NBA teams and fill out questionnaires send it back to them. They would call Coach Sutton or call your agent or whatever. And uh, I only took one visit. I went out to the, I went out to Portland and met with them. Wow. And that was it and came back and uh, went to New York and Coach Sutton was there and wound up getting drafted by the Knicks. The Knicks did send me a questionnaire and I did fill out the questionnaire with the Knicks and uh, wound up getting drafted by the Knicks. So it's totally different than it is now about getting drafted, all the hoopla and all that. No, it wasn't that stuff. No. <laughs> nah. Nah. Uh -uh. What was Coach Sutton's advice, like after your senior year? No, well, he just he just he just wanted me to take well, it up to it. Yeah, well, he had taught me uh, to take it to the NBA and to do what you do best, which I thought was always unique. He always said, "Do what you do best as a player," and that's what I did for ten years in the yeah. NBA. And uh, I talked to Coach a lot when I was in the league, off and on, just we would touch base, and he would ask me how I was going. I asked him how he was going. So, uh, you know, he was. A, big time in my life the whole time what what um and he was a huge influence oh he's a great influence he's a huge influence on me he's, he's an influence on me on the way i coach and the way i handle players to this day what what your first practices when you were there with coach sutton <laughs> as a young player what was the toughest things to get used to <laughs> Well, taking those taking those damn charges, <laughs> <laughs> sitting up there taking those charges one after another, one after another. But I can't say that Coach Gail Carnder at West Star Community College, legendary coach, Coach Ron Brewer, uh, senior, uh, Coach Almer Lee, he got me prepared for the University of Arkansas because everything Coach Sutton was doing offensively and defensively, we were running at West Star. So when I got there, it was an easy adjustment for me. So you played on some of the great teams of all time in razor, in a Razorback uniform with some of the greatest players of all yep. time. Yep, had a crew. Alvin Robinson, Joe Klein. Um, God Hastings. Hastings. Tony Alan. Brown. Tony Brown. My USC. man Valentine. Charles Valentine. Charles Valentine. <laughs> yeah, we, we, had a, we had a good team. And yeah. those were some good basketball teams my three years at the University of Arkansas. We were really good basketball teams. What, what were um, – just going back in, in those seasons that you that you played, uh, you had some big wins. Uh, Sweet Sixteen uh, got to those those tournaments. What, what do you as, as we get ready for the tournament now? We got obviously the conference tournament this weekend, but the NCAA tournament. What uh, what stood out to you about those those years and you guys battling in the NCAA tournament? Man, it was it was it was great. I remember we uh, we beat Mercer and then we played. At the time, we played LSU in the Superdome, and that was the largest Ooh. crowd ever to see a uh, NCAA basketball game at that time. I think that was my sophomore season, and we, we lost to LSU. Uh, I remember losing to uh, Louisville mm -hmm. <laughs> my senior year. <laughs> we were going to play Kentucky if we won that game and get back to the Elite Eight, I do believe. And we lost a little tip in uh, by Derek Smith, who was a great player in the NBA and eventually lost his life on him on the boat, he had a heart attack, whatever, he was sick. Uh, but we had some great basketball teams. I think we were, we were ranked as high as four or five in the country at one time. Had some big wins over the University of Michigan uh, in, in Barnhill. Uh, some good wins against the University of Houston with with, the, with, the, with Olajuwon and Drexler and Nishaw and Rob Williams and those guys. So Southwest Conference was rolling at that time. It's that time of year again, folks. Conference tournaments are tipping off. Bubble teams are making their final push for a bid while the best teams in the country are gearing up for a deep run. Auto bids will be punched, slippers will be fit, and our partners at DraftKings Sportsbook 
America's top-rated sports book of putting my listeners at the center of the action. If you bet $4 on an underdog in a select game this week, that underdog wins, you win $256. That's right, $256. Bucks. Here's how it works. Download the app now and use the promo code FIELD68 when you sign up. Scroll through the list of select underdogs, bet $4 on them, you win, and cash $256 when they do. There's no better way for you to put your college hoops knowledge to use than to put your money where your mouth is with DraftKings Sportsbook. It's safe, it's secure, it's reliable, and you can deposit and withdraw your funds at your convenience. So remember, that's code FIELD68, F-I-E-L-D-68. That's FIELD68 to turn $4 into $256. For a limited time only, must be 21 years or older. Restrictions apply. Go to DraftKings.com for details. And if you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. Yeah. Well, for people who haven't had uh, an opportunity to watch a game in Barnhill, all these young bucks. Yeah, and about the barn. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I like Bud Walt. You had to make a change. You had to get, for revenue purposes, you had to get right. a bigger uh, arena. Thank, thank God for the Walton family, Bud Walton, uh, to write, to write the check. But hey, let me tell you something, man. Barnhill is a special place, man. Yeah. It's a special, special place. Those 9,500 was on top of your head in there, man. And it was loud. It was loud. Did you ever think a team actually walked in there, like, thinking that they could come out with that win? I mean, they knew they were already beaten by the time they got off the bus. Let me, tell you <laughs> Let me see. How many times did I lose in Barnhill in three years? <laughs> Twice. <laughs> yeah, is that right? Twice? Lost to, lost to Akeem Olajuwon and Drexler and that crew. Wow. And we, lost, and we lost to Texas one time in a low-scoring game in the 40s. That's the only time that I lost in Barnhill, as far as I know, was two times. That's it. Two times. Oh, the barn was a bad place, man. It was, a, it was, it was like a bad it was place. Alive. It was alive. It was a bad place. You played in the barn, didn't you? Man, we never played. We, I got no, there. It. it was like the second or third year, Bud Walton yeah. was. Yeah, you missed it. Yeah, you missed the barn. I missed barn. it, man. <laughs> God, yeah, the, the we practiced there a couple of times. Barn is different, man. I'm just telling you, the barn is different. <laughs> <laughs> What's, uh, I want to get to your playing uh, days. Well, first, yeah, let, let's talk about that. So you played, well, in the, in the mid-'80s. You go right. to the New York Knicks. You're in the Eastern Conference, the Atlantic Division. Yep. That's tough division. You had Boston and Milwaukee and Philadelphia. Ooh. That's a pretty good division. Sydney was, Sydney was still in Milwaukee, right? Sydney, Sydney was uh, was was one of the top 10, 15, play, 15 players in the in the in the, in the in the in the league at that time. So yeah, he doesn't get enough uh, historical no, credit. No, no, Sydney was a great player. Ain't no ifs, ands, and buts about that. It took, it took forever for them to put him in the Hall of Fame, but right. they finally put him in. Uh, Coach, Eastern, Conference, Eastern Conference was good, Patrick. It was good. You had Boston. You good. Had Philly. Bernard King with you in the in the Knicks. He was filthy, coach. He and was, he playing he in was. Madison Square Garden, the Mecca. The That's Mecca. the Mecca. It was a it was a great place to play at. Uh, if you could play in New York, you could play anywhere. And, uh, and the, the, the the New Yorkers respected me because I played hard. I was a gritty player. I was a tough, hard nosed player. So I never worried about getting booed at all. So <laughs> uh, you could play in New York. You could play anywhere. And I had a great run there in New York for three years. It was great. So we see now like. Of course, with the Lakers, you always saw Jack Nicholson on a side on, on, on court side and other celebrities. And that's been the big thing is who who if you you're walking into a game in Madison Square Garden in New York City. 80s. Who are some of the people the, the celebrities you see right there on uh, Celebrity Row drinking uh, champagne, eating shrimp cocktail? Grace Jones. You don't know. Who, you don't even know who Grace Jones yeah, is. I know Grace Jones. Grace That's Jones. Back in the day. Bill Cosby was there. Col Columbo was there. So we Columbo. had. Our, we hey, had. I love that show. Woody Allen was there. So we had our share of. Yeah. Uh, of celebrities, trust me. We had our share of celebrities. It's just with social media and and TV and the NBA taking off the last 15, 20 right. years. Just totally. It's just totally different now. It's you the place to be. The NBA is the place to be now to be seen. It is, man. It's crazy. And, and uh, did, did you ever get any pressure from I – I can, I can imagine walking the streets in New York City. Like, it's such a big city. 
Everybody knows who you are. Everybody it's knows who you are. Sports, it's a sports town. You ever get pressure when they say, come play play against me in the Rucker League? Come on. I, I, never went up, I never went up to Rucker. Never got a chance to go up to Rucker and play because when the summertime came, I was trying to get back to Arkansas, <laughs> and unwind and, and, and hang out with people. So, uh, but I knew about the Rucker League. It was it, it was legendary with the likes of Will Chamberlain, Dr. J, Bernard King, everybody played in the Rucker League. When you went back and played the Bulls in, in, in those days, was it like uh, they, th you know, roll out the parade? All, all, all yeah. No, I mean, I had a lot of people at the game, which sometimes was bad because your phone rang all day in the hotel. Everybody asking for tickets. So oh, man. But it was always it was always great to go back. You didn't home. have a ticket guy? No, nah, everybody went, no, nah, ticket guy. No, what's that? <laughs> We didn't have anybody working for us. We worked for ourselves. <laughs> so it was always fun to go back home and hang out with family and hang out in Chicago. I love playing in the old Chicago stadium. Oh, my God. Right. That's one of my favorite stadiums in the NBA was the old Chicago stadium. It was beautiful. So I'm a little biased, obviously. I'm a, I'm, I grew up in Boston. Right. Fell in love with basketball in the 80s, fortunate enough. Um, I only got to see Bird play in the Boston Guard because tickets were not easy. Not, right. not, people, so kids, kids don't understand now. Like, it, it you couldn't get tickets to somebody. No, these no. it was uh, sold out. The Garden was sold out, and so was and so was the uh, yeah uh, the well, Boston well, Guard. Played against some of the greatest teams ever, and with the best players ever. Um, what, what do you remember from those Celtics teams? You played against the 86 I mean, Celtics. They, they, were, they were so good. I mean, you're talking about how many Hall of Famers you got? Larry Bird, Dennis Johnson, McHale. Parrish. Robert the Parrish. The big chief. That's, that's, Bill Walton played on the 86. And Bill Walton. So that's, that's five Hall of Famer. Plus their coach, Casey Jones, was a Hall of Famer. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about five Hall of Famers. Danny Ainge was a really good basketball player. Joe Henson was a really good basketball player. Cedric Maxwell, who is not in the Hall of Fame, was a really good ball player, made a couple of All-Star teams. So uh, we took them to seven games uh, in the semifinals uh, before we got, before they, before they won and went to the Eastern Conference Finals. So I played in the area with Dr. J and Moses Malone. And who was your matchup? Who, who was your defensive match? You My matchup we played Boston was, was, uh, was, was Danny Ainge or Dennis Johnson. I had one of those two. Did you have a fist fight him? Everybody wanted to fight. Well, me and Danny had a hell of, me and Danny had a heck of a fight in the garden my, <laughs> my rookie year. We 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 had a fight from one end of the court to the other end of the court. And uh it was not it was not nice. I can tell you that. <laughs> the only part about it, I don't, I don't I don't even think we got fined. We just got kicked out of the game. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. Different. Now you have a fight like that, you may be suspended for 10 games. Oh yeah, no question. No it, question. Just, it was just a different league. It was a more physical league, but it was really there's some good players everywhere. It was players out west. There was players in the east. You think about those great teams in Milwaukee that could never get to the finals. Those were some great teams. Could not get to the finals. You know, you got Dr. J yeah. and Moses Malone. The east was, man, that east was really good. It yeah. was good. It, 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 it was filthy. And then you played... Well, how did you get so close? So you played with the Bulls and Jordan in '93. Well, I got, I got, I got after my third year with the Knicks. I got traded to Denver Nuggets. Played one year, and then got traded to Washington and played about four or five years. And mm. got traded to the Pistons. And got cut in my tenth year, going to my tenth year with the Pistons, and got a call from Jerry Krause one day, sitting at home. I was sitting at home in Little Rock. And, uh, he called me and said, "There, I said, yeah, who's this? Jerry Krause? Hey, Jerry, how you doing, man?" I'm doing fine. Would you be interested in a 10 day contract? I said, absolutely. I would be. <laughs> and one 10 day led to another 10 day led to me being signed for the rest of the season and was able to, uh, to win a, a three P championship with Chicago bulls and, and form a relationship with Scotty and, and, and Michael that I have to this day. Yeah. So you were living in Little Rock. How come you decided to. After I got waived in Detroit. And so I moved all my stuff. I came home. <laughs> why, came why did home. you end up uh, making your home in Little Rock? Well, I didn't want to go back to Chicago and live. My wife is from Little Rock. Uh, my wife ran track, was all American in track at the University of Arkansas. So oh, I just wind up living here. The people in the state of Arkansas is, uh, has been so, so good to me, instrumental in, in my life and my career. The same thing, the same thing with you. People yeah. ask you why you go back to Boston or Massachusetts. Like you, 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 you get, you got here, you like it, the fans and the people are good to you. So you stay. <laughs> and golf courses are pretty good up there. There's a lot of golf courses here. 
good ones too. Yeah, that's right. What what um what was it about Jordan that stood out to you? You think that that helped him? And you you've been around the best. You played with the best. I played with some great ones. I played with some great ones. I played with Bernard King, who, who if he didn't tear his knee my second year, uh, God knows he he'll be. Conversation would be different about him. He probably would be in the top fifty of all time players. Bernard King. Right. Uh, he had a devastating knee injury. I played with some great ones. Alex English, who's in the top five or top 10 in the league and scoring of all time. I played with Moses Malone. So I right. played with Isaiah Thomas and Joe Dumar. So I've played with some phenomenal players and they all have that, that have that gene, that gene of greatness and that gene that said, I want to win at all costs. All those guys wanted to win at all costs. So, and MJ had that, had that in him, win at all costs. Uh, he was, uh, he was a guy that took no prisons, but all the great ones didn't take any prisons. Bernard King didn't take any prisons. Isaiah didn't take any prisons. So, uh, when you're a great one like that, you have some DNA in you that's this this ultra competitive. Right. And I'm sure uh you you get you get pretty competitive with him on the golf course. <laughs> uh, you know what I haven't I haven't golfed with uh MJ in so long and he's he's built a beautiful, beautiful course uh down in, in Jupiter called the Grove uh 23 or something like that. You can look it up. It said it's a phenomenal course. And he texted me a couple months ago, asked me when I was gonna come down and see the course and play. And I said, hey man. I'm trying to win some basketball games. I ain't got to <laughs> golf. <laughs> Text me back, LOL. But you know, as soon as, as, soon as I get some free time, I, and uh, I'm gonna go down there for a couple of days and just hang out and, and, and play with his valet guy George, who's been working with MJ forever. Him and I got a great relationship. And uh, I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna stay in my lane. I'm gonna stay in the between the 13 and 15 handicap lane. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> I'm getting my new clubs, coach. At the end of this month, I'm getting my new clubs. I'll be I'll be in Little Rock. It ain't the club. It's, it's the club E. It ain't the clubs. It's the club E. <laughs> That's true. The, the guy the guy the swinging. Guy the clubs. It ain't the clubs. What uh, you coached in the NBA too? So what's um, what, what mentality and approach do you have to have that differs from college? when you're coaching in the NBA? Well, it's funny because I, 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 I'm pretty much direct with my guys and some of them can take it and some of them can't. But that's all I know how to do. I come from a, a, a business and a league that's pretty direct, Pat. It's pretty direct about right. your job and keeping your job and all that stuff. So I'm pretty direct uh, with my guys. Uh, one thing I learned is not to, uh, you may get mad at a player in practice or whatever and say some things, but when practice is over with, that's over with. You don't bring that back to the next practice or the next game. Because in the NBA, I can be mad at you on Monday, but I can't stay mad at you, Patrick. We got a game not only Monday, we got one Tuesday and Wednesday. So <laughs> you have to throw that out the window and get ready for the next day. So, uh, what, what were the challenges of, of coaching, like, in the NBA? And, and I can I – mean, it just seems like it's – it's a it's really, it's really different now in, the, in, the, in the, 1995 or 96 when I became a head coach of Toronto Raptors, which I – I shouldn't have been a head coach because I wasn't ready to be a head coach, but I knew how to uh, deal with players and I knew how to stand up in the locker room and, and say what I need to say and, and be direct with guys. So uh, and that's how I was able to get my respect. But at the end of the day, it's totally different now because the money is so huge. It's yeah. easier to get rid of a coach than it is to get rid of a player. It's only a certain amount of coaches that had control, Phil Jackson, right. Pat Riley, and uh, uh, Popovich. Those guys had control because they won – uh, the owner wasn't interested in making any changes uh, with the coach. Every time something goes wrong, it's always the coach's fault, which is not true. Yeah, you're the head of the ship, but it, it's it's not it's not always your fault. Right. And today, like I said, it's easier to get rid of a coach than it is a player. I was I just read an article where right now they did all the numbers, and former players for some reason are at an all time low as NBA head coaches. It, it, in 10 years ago, I think it hit actually an all-time high. Well, and that's then, that's because, Patrick, let's just be honest. You have you have a lot of new owners coming in that's that's tech guys and made their money through hmm. analytical stuff. I'm not a big analytical guy. I, I, I'm just not. I, I'm just not. Because I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you something. If that three-point line wasn't there, wouldn't nobody be jumping up shooting that bad shot. Nobody. <laughs> At the end of the day, you got a lot of analytical guys that's buying teams, and you got a lot of analytical guys that's never played this, this looking at numbers and projecting on how good a player can be. Right. And it's just, to me, it's just ludicrous. Uh, and I can give you an example. Jerry West 
traded Vladi Diva, who was a damn good player, for 18-year-old Kobe Bryant. He traded him to Charlotte for this 12th pick or the 18th, whatever pick it was, for Kobe Bryant. Didn't know analytic, analytics tell Jerry West anything. He brought Kobe. He watched film. He right. brought Kobe in for a workout against Michael Cooper. He watched the workout and said, this kid is going to be a player. Mm -hmm. And he traded a really good player a couple of times, all-star Vlade Divac, to Charlotte for 18-year-old player. So I don't know what analytics would have said about that <laughs> right now, to be honest about it. So I'm not a big fan of analytics. I just think the NBA is run by a lot of guys that have never played at all. And I'm not saying that it's not a place for them. I'm just saying uh, it should be a place for the guys that have played before to have some jobs. But it's it's not like that. It's all set up for analytical guys, these young these young hippie guys, man, that don't know anything about the game. All they know is crunch numbers, get on the computer, and project whether a player can play or not. You know, it's just it's yeah. it's, it's, it's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. It's it's really it's really sad. Yeah, it is. Have you thought how rule changes may happen? I was asked this question a couple of weeks ago. Like, what potential rule changes you, could you see in the game of basketball? Do you think there'll be, there'll be any that with what you being said, how everything's sort of getting more into three-point line and all these different things. Well, the game is set up for guys to score. The, the, numbers that's, the numbers that are being scored in the NBA now is just ludicrous. Crazy. You know, I've talked to some NBA guys, and I won't even mention their names. They're Hall of Fame guys. They, like, they, they just think it's ludicrous. Don't nobody have any pride. Don't nobody guard anymore. Right. It's just, it's just unbelievable. The game is changing. I got no problem with that. The game has changed from when we played in the 80s. I, I have no issue with it. It's just, it's just funny that it's the numbers are 150 to 140. The numbers are just crazy, 135 to 130. I mean, yeah. I'm just going. We used to people used to pride themselves in the 80s. Hey, don't let them get 100. Right. Don't let them get 100. Yeah, they may have 100 at halftime. <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's a different game, and uh, it, it can't make any more rule change. What changes are they going to make, Pat? The first one to 200 win. Other than a four pointer, right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's just it's just a different it's just a different game. Yeah, yeah. I don't watch it. Uh, people think because I, I I don't I don't watch NBA. Yeah, I watch it. I watch strictly college basketball. I don't watch it. What, what's uh real quick? A uh, few more minutes. I appreciate you taking the time and, and uh, busy. So, what, what's your your recruiting approach? Cause well, because we we for many years, you know, I lived in Little Rock many years. I love Little Rock. And, and we've always built up Little Rock uh, and the state of Arkansas. I mean, right. it is a jewel, right? right? We both know it. We're both. Uh, yeah, no doubt. To, to live there. Um, when you hit the recruiter, because I, I got to imagine it's a lot different, you know, even, you know, obviously from when we played and how you approach it, the needs of the kids, you got to think more. <laughs> no, it ain't. It, hey, coach, this is how it worked in my house. Coach Richardson called. Talk to my mother, talk to my father. They said, yes, this is where you're going to go. <laughs> In so that, we, we both got the same story. <laughs> we both, you, you got so many handlers, AAU, so many hanger-ons telling kids what to do. Your NBA player, blah, blah, this, blah, blah, that. Yeah. At the end of the day, I, I can deal with it. I have a problem dealing with kids. I mean, I got a great sense of humor. I know how to deal with them. Uh, at the end of the day, here, here, here in Little Rock, we uh, – we're inner city school, so we have to we have to recruit all over the place. And people say, "Man, you got players from overseas. You got players from Florida. You got players from New York. You got players from Texas." Yeah, because being in the league as long as I was as a coach, as a scout, as a player, executive, I've got a lot of people call me all the time with players, Patrick. So recruiting has never been an issue here. Right, right. Coach Coach, coach Baker has done a great job in uh, in uh, uh, in recruiting and what we do here, and we built we built something good here. This is my third year. Uh, we did we, the first year was a bad year. The second year we won it. The third year we was expect to win it this year, but C19 and players leaving and, and opting out and all that wasn't the year that we quite wanted to have. But trust me, we're reloading and uh, recruit. We have to be different in our recruitment because we're an inner city school. Let's just sure. be honest about it. Yeah, we we t when uh, we would always talk, we'd be like metropolitan school. Metro yeah, well, 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 that's what it, that's what it is. And it, it, it look, it, we have a beautiful campus here. We have a great facility that the Stevens family has given us a great facility, a great practice facility. So for a small mid-major, we got some, we got some things to work with. 
Uh, and that's why we've been able to go out and get some, some really good players to come in and play here. So for all our Razorbacks, brothers and sisters, Trojans, brothers and sisters, everybody is excited of the getting on the schedule. Hogs and Trojans. Well, I think, I think that might happen. Most and I have had some conversations. We tried to do it this year, but just wasn't just wasn't going to work. Yeah. I still think Hunter, Hunter has done a great job of, of taking the state and bringing it all together and not separating it, bringing it all together, which I think is, he's done a great job of doing that. And we're, we're looking forward to playing Arkansas. And, you know, you got to play somebody. I mean, <laughs> there's no sense of them playing a money game with somebody in the Sunbelt Conference. And we're right here in the Sunbelt Conference and we could use the money. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's just like University of Arkansas, Pine Bluff and football. You know, Arkansas should play them and give them some money. So uh, that's that's great what Hunter's doing. I'm excited about it. I think it's great. It's great for the state. Yeah, it sounds good. So, um, well, Coach, I appreciate it. You well, know, thanks for having me. Like I said, I'm bringing my clubs. And okay. so you – because I know you – listen, you got the velvet touch to get on any golf course in the state of Arkansas. I'm just going to leave it out there. I'm just going to leave it out there. <laughs> I mean, there's some great courses here. <laughs> uh, yeah, coach. We'll get it going. I mean, I, listen, I'll even clean the clubs for you. I'll clean, I'll, I'll dig out the dirt. On, uh, just give me my strokes, man. Just give me my strokes <laughs> and we're good. And we're good, brother. Just give hey, me my coach, strokes. I'm, I'm a, so happy for you, the success on the court. Clark University, you did an excellent job in Atlanta. I'm going to always be indebted to that school, man. Nobody you wanted to, unbelievable job. Nobody wanted to give me a chance. Yeah. With my credentials, I was told that I'd never coached in college. And I would laugh, Patrick, and go, no, I have not coached in college. I coached at the highest level you can go in the profession. And you're telling right. me I can't coach in college. So I took that opportunity. A lot of people talking about that was going to kill my career. Are you crazy to take a school, a job at a little private HBCU school down in Clark, down in Atlanta, Georgia? Let me tell you something, Patrick. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah, you, that was awesome, man. I, I'm just, you did it. And, it and that's fun. an inspiration yeah. that, you know, it's, it's, you did it. And, and my thing is don't let nobody, don't let nobody tell you no, that right. you can't do it. And I, that was my whole goal when I went to Atlanta, that I had some things that I had, I was going to prove that I could coach in college that I could, I, could, I, could run a, I could run a program, I could run it the right way, and I could win games, and that's what I did. Yeah, you did it, man. I, I, it's, that's awesome, man. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for you. The future is, is no Yeah, we're, really, we're trying to build something special here. So I, mm -hmm. I'm at home to be forced up to coach. Basically, this is home since 1983. So it's, it's been fun. We're trying to build a program. C-19 didn't help us as far as, uh, as getting fans in here, and renewing right. season tickets and all that. That really hurt us after the great year that we had last year. But like I said, we're going to regroup and do it again next year. The great Razorback, Darrell Walker, and I like the scoop shot in the in the picture behind you. Is that? Oh, that's the only that's that's going between two Hall of Famers, Dennis Johnson and Larry Bird. They can't hold you. <laughs> they can't hold you. I'm going right between them, gliding right between both of them. Hey, was Bird talking trash when you would glide between? <laughs> no, he was trying to block it at that time. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, man, thanks again. Thanks, so thanks for having me, Patrick. I appreciate you, man. Anytime. I'll call you, and uh, hopefully I'll see you at the end of April. Okay, okay. appreciate it. Thank you so All much. Right. Thanks, Coach. All right. All right.